Well, we, we begin today on an 18-week sermon series. Is that long enough for you? Yeah, I know. It's like if Jesus tarries, we'll make it through this sermon series. 18 weeks. I've never done an 18-week sermon series. So, um, and, and I hope when I'm done, I'll, I'll say that, and you will say, that was a good thing, not a bad thing. But what we do is, uh, what we're doing is we're going to go verse by verse through a book in the Bible, 1 Corinthians. And 1 Corinthians is filled with some really neat stuff. I mean, we're going to talk about sex, you know, for a couple of Sundays, probably. And we're going to talk about fighting and family junk and all that. It's all in 1 Corinthians. And, you know, the, the thing about reading an epistle, which is what 1 Corinthians is, it's a letter from Paul that was written to the church at Corinth somewhere around 55 A.D. But one of the things you want to make sure that you do that we do when we, when we read and interpret this is instead of just picking something out and going, oh man, I know what that means, that's mine. You, we really need to understand the context and, and who the Corinthians were, what was going on in their lives. And sometimes you can do this pretty well and other times it's more difficult. But, but with the church at Corinth, uh, there's a lot of stuff that we, we know about that. And so I want to go through that first before we really get into the text. And first is the, the geography of the city. Corinth is strategically located, ancient Corinth was, was strategically located on an isthmus that connects the Aegean Sea and the Ionian Sea, and it's uh, present-day Greece, and this little isthmus was just four and a half miles wide. So Corinth had two harbors, one on each sea, and this is really a, a very unusual thing because uh, it was very dangerous for ships to go around the southern tip of Greece because it was a lot of winds and, you know, a lot of trouble. So what they would do is they would put into one harbor at Corinth, and then they would unload all their stuff, and they would transport it across this four-and-a-half-mile strip and load it onto another ship. Or if the ship was small, they had a road and they had this apparatus built where they'd take the ship out of the water, put it on these rollers, and roll it four and a half miles and put it in the sea again. Now, to stop and think about being a, a city that has that kind of commerce, you talk about an economic potential. I mean, Corinth turned into, the, just boomed into this city. It, ancient Corinth was revived by the Romans in the first century B.C., but by the time that this is written, I mean, this city is just thriving because of all the commerce. And it was uh, a prime spot for commerce. Literally millions came through there every year, traveling from Athens to other points east, like Rome. And it was located, uh, it was just a place of great opportunity. If you wanted to get a job, if you wanted to advance, you went to Corinth. It was kind of like, you know, um, as Americans, many of us, if you fly any place, where you have to go through? You have to go through Atlanta or O'Hare if you want to get anywhere in America. And that's kind of what Corinth was. It was just the crossroads of the world. And it was a Roman city. Uh, Rome made it a colony, which meant that it would have all the benefits of the emperor inhabited by Romans. There would be a, a coliseum and a racetrack and gymnasiums and library and a forum and there would be a proconsul there. And it was just, I mean, all this stuff was built by Rome. And there was peace and there was commerce and there was a lot of ambition. And it was inhabited by free men, which uh, these were slaves who had been then, for some reason, uh, released from their uh, patrons. And there would be thousands of them in Rome. Rome, when they conquered somebody, would take slaves, and then they would give those slaves to people in payment for what they did in the army. And so you might get three or four slaves, and I don't need three or four slaves, and you might release them. And there were thousands of these freedmen. And the problem was is that in the city of Rome, Caesar never trusted these people. And they were actually citizens. So they populated Corinth with them. And what it meant was these people were citizens, but they had no inheritance. They had no money. Uh, they, they might have a lot of ambition, but, uh, but that was about it. And so uh, Corinth is one of those cities, and we have this kind of lower middle class economic strata, uh, mainly that's in Corinth. Um, no social status. It appears that the church of Corinth was just filled with freedmen and women and who had found new life in Christ. And Corinth was an extremely religious place. 
Uh, like all of the Greek and the Roman cities, it was filled with a lot of religion. Uh, they had no conflict at all between uh, state and church, uh, which was kind of good and bad. And what was good, that most people were, were looking for a new god at this time. The Greek gods had kind of worn out, and they were looking for something new. And the, the picture here is the remains of the temple that's thought to be of Apollo that was at Corinth. And it kind of gives you an idea of the stature of the city and the kind of things that they had. But close to there, up back, was what was called the Acro Corinth, and this was this huge mound of, of uh, stone about 1,800 feet south of Corinth that, that uh, looked over the city. And on top of this was the temple of Aphrodite. And Aphrodite was the goddess of beauty and sex. And every evening, the the prostitutes of Aphrodite would come down into the city of Corinth with all these sailors and all these people away from home. I mean, this is Vegas. And the, they would come down and give their skills to the people that were there in the city in worship of Aphrodite. You can fill in the blanks. We'll get there later, you know, not in this sermon. But it's here that... Um, in this climate that God chose to start a church, and it was a, a place of extreme pluralism, a, a place experiencing dramatic change, a place of influence where there were millions of new people each year that passed through. It's a place of seekers. It's a place of belief. And it's often been said that ancient Corinth was like taking New York and L.A. and Las Vegas and kind of putting them into one. If you wanted to be somebody in the Mediterranean, you went to Corinth. That's where it was happening. Now, let's get started. Um, as we go through this, uh, you know, I've kind of noticed that uh, gathering nights are not real big Bible packers. Have you noticed that? Did anybody pack one in today? Uh, yeah, we've got him on the floor. We got, he's got one on his phone. You, you know, that counts, that counts, that counts. But anyway, you might, you might want to follow along here, and uh, the Bibles that are on the floor, this is on page 870 if you want to follow along. And you know, there's, uh, just because you pack a Bible doesn't mean you're a right-wing nut, okay? I just want to throw that out there, just saying, you know, that if you want to bring a Bible, that that's okay, all right? Uh, when you're done, you can throw it on the back dash of your car. <laughs> I love that, to see those, those ratty old Bibles in the back dashes of cars. You know, it's there so when I go to church, I can get it. All right, 1 Corinthians 1, 1 to 17. From Paul, called by God's will to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, and from Sothenes, our brother, to God's church that's in Corinth, to those who have been made holy to God in Christ Jesus, who are called to be God's people, Together with all those who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in every place, he's their Lord and ours. Well, this is a real similar uh, salutation that begins most ancient letters and most of our epistles. You know, it, it identifies who the writer is. It's Paul. And also identifies who it's written to. And he says that he is a called apostle. Um, Jesus Christ has called him. Apostle means one who is sent. And, um, of course, there were 13 apostles, the, the original 12 minus one, Judas, who they replaced with Matthias. And then Paul is the 13th, as he's called by God with that special Damascus Road conversion. And then he speaks to, the, to God's church that at, that's in Corinth. I, I love that phrase, God's church who's in Corinth. You, I mean, it's God's church. It's, it's not anybody else's church. It's God's church. It isn't Paul's church. It isn't their church. Um, I mean, they, they give their tithes and they have leadership in the church, but it isn't their church. This is God's church. And it's just a part of God's church. It just happens to be the one that's in Corinth. So if this letter were being written to us, it would be written to God's church at Old Todd's Road, Lexington. That's who it would be written to. All right, and, and, and we get this all mixed up, you know, and I, this is kind of Paul's first shot of truth over their head to correct him because he's going, you're not the only church. 
It's, it's not about you guys. You think you are. Here you are. You've been, you've been in existence a couple of years, mainly made up of people that knew nothing about Jesus whatsoever. You've got no Bible. You know no Old Testament. There isn't an Old Testament that's even circulating around. I was with you for a year and a half, and now you think you're somebody, you know? And so he's kind of firing the first shot over them. And uh, they don't run the church. They're not all that. The word church in Greek, one of the meanings of it is a called out people. And each church really has two addresses, a geographic address, which is in Corinth or on Old Todd's Road, and a spiritual address, which is in Christ Jesus. And he says the church is made up of saints. That's what the, the common translations say. Uh, this translation says made holy to God. And again, a saint is not a dead person that everybody says, man, wasn't she or he great? And weren't they really great people? We'll call them a saint. But a saint is every person that's been made holy, every person that's in Christ. So these words are written to those who've been called out, uh, made holy to God in Christ Jesus. And that means that they didn't do anything to become holy. God made them holy. God declared them holy. Um, well, we, we kind of get off track there sometimes. We think we have to do something to be acceptable by God. Paul states right off here that they didn't. And it's to God's church in Corinth. Um, you know, to that Corinthian church that we said, hey, I'm going to go to church. They would have said, what? What do you mean go to church? Because they had no concept whatsoever as the church being a physical, geographical location. And yet that's primarily how we think of church as being a place, a location, you know, and the bigger your location and the better looking your location, the better church it is. That's the way Americans think. They, they had that, did not have that concept at all. To go to church was to go to be with a community of people. It was about a relationship. It was being in a relationship with a bunch of people who are called out. And I, I think it's just really, you know, a shame that, that we think of um, church to be a place rather than a relationship because um, when we think of it being a physical location um, we, we think that when we go there that now since we are there we are acceptable to God since we are in the church building didn't have that concept at all did you know that they sold uh, the crystal cathedral everybody know what the crystal cathedral is it's a place out in LA Anaheim I think and Robert Schuler started it years ago. He started this church out of a drive-in theater, and then it, it grew, and they got a lot of money, and they built this structure, which still is, you know, outside of cathedrals, probably the most, you know, lavish structure built to God anywhere with, uh, I don't have a picture of their pipe organ. Their pipe organ is just absolutely obscene. I mean, it's, it's just huge. And they've got, you know, if you saw it on TV, they've got like a stream of water that goes down. The, we could do that here. <laughs> you know, a little, little kid's pool, maybe a little children's pool up here, have our own water thing going, a little fountain going. You know, we could have our own cathedral. But, but anyway, that's what they did. And then Schuler fell on some hard times, and he and his son got in a fight, and they went bankrupt. And so they sold it to the Catholic Church for $50 million dollars. I yet to see what the Catholic Church is going to do with this place, you know, fifty million dollars. But there, at last I saw, uh, the congregation was dwindling down pretty bad, and they had moved out of the big place into a smaller one, and the Catholics were still letting them meet there. But I mean, here is a good example of somebody that got it kind of mixed up. Instead of it being about the people, about the community, they thought it was about the building, and it just went, they just went lavish overboard with it's all about the building. Well, let's go on. He continues with these opening remarks. Verse 3 says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always for you because of God's grace that was given to you in Christ Jesus. That is, you were made rich through him in everything, and all your communication and every kind of knowledge, in the same way that the testimony about Christ was confirmed with you. The result is that you aren't missing any spiritual gift while you wait on our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also confirm your testimony about Christ 
until the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful and you were called by him to partnership with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, Paul's still saying some pretty nice things to them because he is establishing the truth of what is the reality of really knowing Jesus Christ and being a follower and they have been given God's grace in Christ Jesus and that means that they were given pardoned that they didn't deserve is, is what he's saying they were lost as Paul would say without hope in the world and God found them and gave them grace God's riches at Christ's expense and then he says you were made rich through him and everything you know I have to talk about this about being rich don't you all right. He says, you were made rich through him. Uh, benefit is a result of God's grace. No one earns God's grace. It's always a gift. And, and they and we are made rich. For about the last year or two, I've had this little joke that I pull at restaurants and other places. The family is getting tired of it. They don't think that it's funny anymore. I think it's still hilarious every time that I do it. It's one of those jokes that just never wears out. And the joke is, is that you're in a, you know, a ritzy restaurant and everybody, as they say, is kind of putting on the dog and, you know, they just, oh, this is nothing, man. I, yeah, Malone's, whatever, you know, it's just, it's just great to be here and I'm just, I'm just so rich. And the, uh, the, the waiter will come up and say, do you want any appetizers? And you go, and I say, yeah, bring them all. We're rich. How many do you want us to buy? you know nine or ten appetizers because we are just so rich we want everybody to see how rich we are you know and <laughs> and they kind of look at you and they go and one guy you know said well I'm gonna get a good tip and and, and he did he get because he caught on to it but I'm just being sarcastic you know at some places where it's kind of pretentious you know and people want to show how rich they are by what they buy and want everybody else to see it and when reality they're probably not that rich at all not just with material lessons or material things but they're they're probably poor really in God's eyes because they don't possess the things of real value things like you know contentment and joy and peace and respect and so what we do is we try to fake it with all this, this stuff and say, I'm okay because look how, how rich I am. And Paul says, you're rich in Christ. Don't you know how rich you are? And I'll, I'll just wonder as Christians, you know, if, if we are really rich in everything, can you say that you're rich in Jesus Christ? Paul goes on to say that they aren't missing any spiritual gift that they're rich in God, and later in the letter, he's going to talk about spiritual gifts. We'll get there. And he spends a whole chapter talking about these gifts of the Spirit that there are. And then he says, he reminds them of the great wealth, and he says, and you were called by him to partnership with his Son. Rich in God, every spiritual gift, in partnership with Jesus Christ. Wow. He says, that's who you are, Corinthians. Before I correct you in any way, this is who you are. You're rich, you got every spiritual gift, and you're in partnership with Jesus Christ. Now, right now as they're reading that letter, I think, in Corinth, and um, Paul sends it with some messengers to read it to them correctly so they understand everything and to put emphasis where he wants emphasis. And as we're reading this or listening to this today, um, there might be some worried people. And we're thinking, wow, uh, rich towards God, um, contentment, uh, peace, patience, respect, joy, partnership with Jesus, spiritual gifts. Hmm. I, you know, what's he talking about? I mean, maybe they're wondering, is this true, really? Is what he's saying true, or is this just preacher spin? You know, you're just giving a bunch of religious things that try to, you know, fill up the time. Just preacher spin, just good marketing, you know, for this little sect of religion. Or if, if Paul is an apostle, or for us, if the Bible is true, then why am I not experiencing this in my life? 
Why, why am I not feeling rich towards God? Why am I not feeling like I've got every spiritual gift? Why am I not feeling like Jesus is my partner? And, and then maybe the next thing is, 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 what do I need to do to get rich like that? Well, I want to encourage us today uh, just to kind of let those expectations, let those promises um, push us a little bit. You know, um, Push us for more uh, wealth in God. Push us for more uh, partnership with Jesus. Push us for more spiritual gifts. See, after you, you, you hang around the Christian community uh, for a while, you feel kind of weird uh, admitting that you're not as rich as everybody else is. Because the Christian community, not us here at the gathering, obviously we're perfect, but, but the Christian community in general, there's always all these people that are, oh, my, my family is just so wonderful. My children are just fantastic. And my husband is the most wonderful thing in the world. And, you know, uh, we just get every blessing from Jesus that there is. And, and uh, nothing bad ever happens in my life. And, oh, praise Jesus. Glory, hallelujah, Jesus. And aren't my teeth white? And, you know, just, it's just on and on with this, this kind of, you know, God is just so good to me, and, and you feel kind of weird saying, uh, well, you know, um, I'm not sleeping at night because I'm worried about stuff. And they would go, oh, yeah, that's nice. Now go away. Let me talk about how wonderful life is. And after you've hung around the church a while for that, I'm, you, we all know, you know, um, we, we've heard of people like that. We don't know people like that, but we've heard of people like that. But... It, it's so hard to bring up that, man, I'm having a rough time in that context. I mean, it really is. It's hard to say, you know, I'm just not getting it. I just, I just feel like a pauper in God. I don't, I, you know, I'm not, I don't know if I'm saved or not. Boy, there's some you don't talk about in church, right? I don't know if I'm saved or not. Man, they'll, they'll slap you around, throw you out. You know, you start talking like that, right? And, and I just wonder, I, I want this to push us. You know, these high expectations of being rich in God, of being a partner with Jesus Christ. I want this to push us to God, not push us away. Because Paul isn't saying, okay, if you're not rich, if you're not in partnership, if you don't have spiritual gifts, then just get out. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying, here are the possibilities for you, Corinthians. And he kind of suspects that the way that they're acting because they've written him this letter, and he's heard from this, this lady, Chloe, about all these things that are going on there, and he's going, they're, they're not in Christ. And so he, he's trying to tell them what, what the opportunity is here. You see, before we can receive really what God has to give us, we have to really admit where we are. You can't fake it. You, you can't fake it with God. You can't say, oh, it's just wonderful, and everybody in my life is just fantastic, and I just can't imagine how I could get any better. You can't fake it. You know, God knows. And we have to take a, a real account of what's going on. And, and you know, if, if, if you feel like a loser today, admit that you feel like a loser. If you feel like you're, you're spiritually poor, admit that you feel like you're spiritually poor. I mean, that's the only way you have to take assessment of where you're standing before you can push on to get what God wants to give you. And God wants to give us all that he has. Listen to this. Philippians 2, 12 to 14. Same writer, Paul. And he says, It's not that I've already reached this goal or have already been perfected, but I pursue it so that I may grab hold of it because Christ grabbed hold of me for just this purpose. Brothers and sisters, I, my don't, I myself don't think I've reached it, but I do this one thing. I forget about the things behind me and reach out for the things ahead of me. The goal I pursue is the prize of God's upward call in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Paul. He says, I'm not there. I haven't perfected it. I, I may be rich in God, but I'm living poor. Okay, I may be a partner. I, I may be, uh, have every spiritual gift available to me, but I'm not using them, and I'm living by myself, and sometimes I'm no, I don't even know if I know Jesus Christ. He says, but 
I'm putting my past behind me, you see. I'm not going to let that overcloud. I'm not going to let that stop me today. I'm going to let it push me towards God because I do believe in these promises. I do believe that he has more for me. All right. Now, we come to the real reason as to why Paul wrote the letter. Uh, verse 10, he says, Now I encourage you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, agree with each other and don't be divided into rival groups. Instead, be restored with the same mind and the same purpose. My brothers and sisters, Chloe's people gave me some information about you that you're fighting with each other. What I mean is this, that each one of you says, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, I belong to Cephas, that's, that's Peter, I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in Paul's name? Thank God that I didn't baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that nobody can say that you were baptized in my name. Oh, I baptized the house of Stephanus too. Otherwise, I don't know if I baptized anyone else. <laughs> kind of, yeah, I know. You kind of get the idea Paul's making this up as he goes along. Oh, yeah. I know there was him and him and him. Okay. Then verse 17. Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news. And Christ didn't send me to preach the good news with clever words so that Christ's cross won't be emptied of its meaning. That's where we pick up next week. It's with the cross. You see, one of the main problems in Corinth and Lexington and in America, as Paul says, is divisions and factions and fighting. And when Paul wrote the letter to Corinth. He was in Ephesus, and it says that Chloe's people came and tattled on him. Said, man, they're, you've left, but they're fighting like dogs. They're in Corinth. There's all kinds of divisions. Some of them were saying, Paul, he's the man. He's the apostle. He started us. And others were saying, oh, his sermons are so long, and he's kind of boring. He doesn't tell funny jokes, and he doesn't have nice stories. Apollos is a much better preacher. I like Apollos. And others were saying, oh, Peter, he's the dude. He, he was there with Jesus, you know. Have you seen him walk on water? Wow, what a show, you know. So we've got these factions. So that's so silly, isn't it? Sounds like kids saying, I know you are, but what am I? Right? Just back and forth and back and forth. Focus on Jesus, we would say. He's, he's all that you need. Isn't it all about Jesus? I mean, the man or the woman who brings the message is just a servant, just a carrier. I mean, well, we need to remember that before we, um, you know, idolize the people on TV or get into arguments with someone else over what she said and he said and all the Christian celebrity clubs and our theological groups and over 450,000 congregations in America. And we are, without a doubt, the most divided nation of Christians in the world. 450 different congregations. The Christian church of which we're a part was formed to do away with all that. We said, what we're going to do, and this was started here in the early 1800s, right here in Lexington, was one of the seed beds. And the founders said, this denominationalism, all this sectarianism, it's bad. And so we're just going to melt into the body of Christ, just have one body, one church. Great idea. We started another division in the church is what we did. Now we're called the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. And we just started another denomination. It, it didn't work, did it? And the, the whole thing isn't about denominations being wrong. It's the way that we take all of our identity from those different sectarian groups and those different denominations. See, the minute that we foc focus on our differences, the minute that we focus on our leaders, then we stop focusing on Jesus Christ. This is about unity. Unity is not tolerance. A lot of people think it is. Unity is never negotiated. Unity is never a result of compromise. Unity is determined by our identity, as to where we take our identity. And some were saying, I'm a Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm a Peter, rather than saying, I'm of Christ. Unity 
as you know, you know this, don't you, that unity is such a powerful force. You take two people that are united in one thing in a marriage. Wow, what a strong bond that is. Uh, for good or evil, people who are united in one thing. It's, it's just a very strong bond. Remember that, that Jesus prayed uh, there in the upper room in the 17th chapter of John. He said, I, I pray for you, my disciples, that you would be one so that the world would believe. It's never happened. See, It's never happened that we've been one so that the world would believe. Solomon, in the book of Ecclesiastes, says it in a similar way. He says, also, one can be overpowered, but two together can put up resistance. A three-ply cord doesn't easily snap. Well, that's just simple stuff, isn't it? And remember that Jesus said, if two of you have agreed about anything, it should be done by, for you by my Father who's in heaven. Two of you in agreement here in the church. It's called unity. Unity comes from our identity. Now, the, the division in Corinth will produce a lot of problems for them, as divisions do today. And the, the weakness of the American church, among other things, is primarily one caused by divisions. Um, let's face it, we just don't mix well with people who don't look like us and think like us and talk like us and vote like us. We just don't do it very well because we take our identity from our divisions. It's kind of like, you know, the all-star game for the NFL. That's the most boring two hours, I think. The all-star game for the NFL is the most boring two hours in sports history. A bunch of guys, you know, like the AFC, they'll, maybe they'll put on blue jerseys, and, and the NFC will put on white jerseys, and, you know, NFC, AFC, they got the jerseys on, but then they wear their own team helmets, right? And nobody plays hard for the all-star game. Everybody's afraid of getting hurt because that team helmet, that's where they get their money. That's where their contract is. Their contract isn't with the jersey, isn't with the league. It's with the team. So nobody runs all out. Nobody jumps all out. Nobody hits all out because they want to just get through the game. It's just a show, you know. And I, I think about that in the way that it is with the church. I mean, like we've kind of got Christ on our jerseys, but we've got all these different denominations on our helmets. This is, this is really where our identity is coming from, is I'm Protestant or I'm Catholic or I'm charismatic or I'm liberal or, liberal or progressive or Methodist or, or, or Baptist or what else. And, and that's where our allegiance really lies, is up here in our identity helmet in the church. And we get into all kinds of ruckuses, but the jersey's like, oh, who's really trying? We'll let God take care of the church. Who cares? You know, I'm, I'm going to go with my denomination. You know, go liberals, go conservatives, go evangelicals. Factions are just a result because our identity's all messed up. First and foremost, your identity, whether you've discovered it or not, is that you're a child of God. That's your first identity. That's really the only identity that ultimately matters, is that you're a child of God. So I thought about this for myself. Okay, I'm a, I'm a child of God. That's my primary, should be my primary identity. But I'm also a husband. Uh, I'm a father. I'm a grandfather. Usually not competing identities, but still identities. I'm a pastor. I'm a Kentuckian. I'm a, an American. Um, I'm a male. I'm white. I'm, I can go on and on. Evangelical, I'm Protestant, I'm a Kentucky Cat fan, I'm a St. Louis Cardinals fan, go. And, <laughs> you know, I've got all these different identities in me. But they all fall under the one primary identity of me being a child of God. If I keep my identity in Christ first and foremost, and the fact that I'm, I'm rich in these blessings, I, I have these spiritual gifts, I'm a partner with Christ, then there can be no factions or divisions. It just doesn't happen. If I keep that identity first, and I'll tell you why, it's because no matter what happens to somebody, if, if my identity is, is first with Christ, if, I, if, if I'm my, finding myself in Him, then I'm praying for that person no matter who it is, because they're a child of God too. 
So my heart is with them, no matter what nation they are, no matter uh, what skin color, no, no matter uh, who they voted for. But if I keep my identity in him, my heart is God's heart, and, and there can be no division. There can be no factions. But the minute that I place myself on one of those others, then there are problems. You see, when, when my identity is first as a pastor, then somebody does something against my church, and I'm going to push back, boy. They're not going to get away with that, because that's me. See, that's my primary identity. I have somebody that moves in next to me, and he's got... IU plates on in the back of his car and all that junk on, you know, you know this is going to be a problem. This is going to be a problem, right? You see, I, I will never feel the same for him if my primary identity is as a Kentuckian or as a cat fan rather than being my primary identity being a child of God. If my primary identity is a child of God, I, my heart's going to be towards that person. When I'm first an American, and this is one of the dangers of patriotism, guys. Then uh, if I'm first an American and somebody pushes on my country, I'm ready to kill them. Let's just bomb them. Let's just kill them. They're not, they're, they're not people. We just need to exterminate them to preserve my identity as an American. But if my identity is as a child of God, then I want for them the same as anyone else, right? I want what's good for them because I got God's heart. Do you get what I'm talking about here? It's a hard thing to do. This is a hard thing to keep consistent in our heads. And it doesn't just come from our heads, but it comes from our will. We have to will ourselves to think as children of God, not first as husbands and fathers and mothers and Americans and cat fans and all that other list. So, how rich are you? Um, do you live in the Spirit? Do you have the spiritual gifts? Um, are you a partner with Christ? Are you just a fan or an observer? And where's your identity today? You see, all those other identities, they pass away. None, none of them last. Every, every one of those things, even, you know, parent, uh, wife, uh, son, daughter, all those identities pass away. Only one makes it. Only one we get out of here with, and that's as a child of God. And as a church, um, the, the church of God that meets at 162 Old Todd's Road in Lexington, us, you know, are, are we going to have this identity of first being in Christ and secondly being a contemporary Protestant evangelical denomination? You see, if we, if we keep this in Christ first, we get along with everybody. Now, there's nobody that pushes us around because our identity is in God. What do you think about that? Let's, let's pray through this for just a minute. As deep cries out 